Hey everyone, welcome to Office Hours with Cloud Posse, your weekly dose of insider DevOps trends, AWS news, and Terraform insights, all sourced from our Sweet Ops community, plus a live Q&A you can't find anywhere else. It's August 7th, 2024. I'm your host, Eric Osterman. Real quick, I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator for funded startups and enterprises that helps companies who are overwhelmed with AWS. And we do this by leveraging our over 200 Terraform modules that have been battle tested and downloaded over 100 million times. So no matter where you find yourself on this journey, we are here to help you launch better products faster so you can free up your bandwidth for innovation and nail your value delivery every time. And if you're curious how that goes, uh, you can just go to cloudposse.com slash meet. Again, cloudposse.com slash meet. You'll book a session with me directly. Just answer a few quick questions and uh, we'll get connected. So how can you maximize today's session? First off, our format is very informal. You can engage as much as you'd like and ask questions. And if you're curious about any of our open source tools or modules, go for it. And for those on the recording, we host these calls live. So join us by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours. Now, I do have one ask. If you find any portion of today's office hours valuable, please share it with your team. Just head over to youtube.com slash cloud posse or send us a short testimonial maybe about the value you're getting. So with that said, here is what caught my attention this week. Well, first one isn't so much DevOps related, but we all are very <laughs> probably integrated with Google in one way or another. So it's pretty interesting that uh, at least in the first ruling here, that they've been uh, considered a monopoly on search. And obviously that's going to be contested, but it's been a while since we've seen a big, uh, is it an antitrust type lawsuit like this uh, to try and break up a monopoly come through? We've seen more of this, I think, happening in Europe, but in the US, I don't know, when was the last time, uh, I guess it was with Microsoft in the browsers or something. When was the last big monopoly case like this. All right. Uh, so, yep, that was that. Next topic. Um, let's refresh here. Yeah, that's not working. All right, next topic. I um, can't recall if I brought this up, but I find myself coming here uh, often if I need to find an icon for something I'm working on on AWS. AWS obviously pub publishes an archive with all their own zips, but you got to download it and go find that URL, unpack it and whatnot. This is really convenient as just a way to search for it. You can copy them to your clipboard or download them. Just go to aws-icons.com if that's something you find yourself needing to do. All right, so I think this is probably the most interesting uh, topic of discussion uh, for today. Let me close this, um, which is some of the, what is it, blowback, if you will, of what happened with CrowdStrike. Um, if any of you are familiar with how a lot of exploitations work, it starts with somebody comes across an unexpected crash. And rather than just say, huh, I guess I got to reboot, they start asking the question, wait, why did that happen? Why did that cause a blue screen? And when you start poking at that, then you realize that there's more to this maybe than meets the eye. So while the CrowdStrike incident was, you know, a uh, unfortunate one that took down what seemed like half the internet, what could be the bigger story here is the attack vector that this highlighted. So um, a uh, research team out of China um, has uh, kind of poked a little bit deeper and identified that some of the preconditions of this being exploited exist, uh, both for remote code execution and for privilege ex escalation. And part of the problem is that uh, there's apparently no signing mechanism on the sys file and this sys file uh, can execute pretty much arbitrary code. Um, 
So, and, and obviously the way it's running bypasses a lot of the kernel uh, protection uh, that Windows has. So the potential for this getting exploited in a way that is a hundred times worse than what we just saw is significant unless other changes possibly are made to prevent th that attack vector. That's what I got from it. Uh, I'm not a security expert uh, on these topics. And if somebody is more versed on this, please correct me. Um, or if you have another interpretation of it. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I actually think the, the biggest fail here of um, having read a lot of it is that the, the CrowdStrike quote unquote driver is a, um, it's not really a driver, right? It's there. It's a proxy that, uh, or it's it's a hack to to make it seem like a driver, so that it can load before anything else loads in the system. It can make sure that nothing gets is on disk or gets loaded in memory that you know looks like a threat, um, and it can deal with it. The problem is, is that if you have something that can be that low level, everything else, Microsoft has a program. WHQL or something. It's the Windows Hardware Qualified List or something. I forget whatever it stands for, but um, they have a program to certify these drivers that run in kernel space like this. So they have to go through a program. They have to go through testing. They have to do all these other things. So CrowdStrike did that. They they have a they went through and and they have a certified driver. The problem is is that that driver, when you install version 2.05 of that driver, you don't really install 2.05 because that quote unquote driver loads dynamic content uh, before it, it runs. And that means that you can never, you can, if you allow that, you can never check that what you're running is what you think you're running, right? It, you have to trust implicitly what, CrowdStrike is loading uh, into your into your driver system, right? And and that's pretty scary uh, to me if you think about it that way. That Microsoft is like uh, basically allowed them to distribute something that can bypass all of the checks Microsoft put into place to make sure that these types of things don't happen. Like that's why they have these qualified drivers so that people can't like, you know. Uh, take out large swaths of Windows computers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, I wonder how long it'll take before we see uh, this come back then. Yeah, and also dot 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 CrowdStrike. I don't I don't understand when they know they're when they know their the blast radius of their software, right? They know how many computers this thing is installed on, how they don't have more checks and balances before something can be can can be read. Like as an example, the way that this was actually broken is that dynamic sys file that they're talking about that was read was empty. Right? Mm. And like why <laughs> why was like why is there not like a if you know if file is empty then you know do something <laughs> like check that you know that's more reasonable than just crash the system and make it not like not bootable um how does their ci process allow one of these critical files that's empty to get all the way through and released to millions of customers you know, with with testing and verification and, and validation and everything else. And how they don't have some sort of di digital signature, um, what I was just gonna you say. know, on both sides of it is like just mind blowing to me if that is in fact the case. Obviously, I can only trust what I've read. Uh, I haven't verified it myself. But if that is the case, I mean, like, it, honestly, like the CrowdStrike is, should should be sued out of business if this is the case, because every airline that was delayed and every, you know, whatever that happened is going to file a class action suit and they are going to, because this is just negligence and they're essentially going to be like not in existence anymore. It, 
for this first point, isn't that basically like CrowdStrike doing curl bash on a driver? Pretty much. <laughs> Without signature checks, of course, being the point yeah. there. Yeah. Now, now they according to CrowdStrike, the only thing that I've seen like to re, to rebuff some of this is that they're saying that these sys files cannot cannot do arbitrary code executions. They are they're essentially rule files that adhere to a certain format, and they can basically like they read those 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 rules and then and then do different things. Like they themselves don't contain the binary logic, I guess, of things to run. Um, but maybe I'm maybe I'm like misunderstanding what CrowdStrike said, but that was what their, one of the articles I, I read said that, um, that they are only rule files that instruct the core package to run like binary things that already exist inside the core package. That makes sense. So, so I don't, but but they're actually saying that in this article that CSA agent is Turing complete, meaning that you could you can write something inside of that sys file to actually run like you know run operations independent of uh, the the core the core functions that are already built in to the binary that downloads this. So um, if this is true, then this is much worse than. Uh, than what I thought. Well, and this is interesting when you combine it with what he's talking about here, which is if you then can control the DNS on that machine, this is a perfect way to inject basically whatever file you want. Um, yeah. So yeah. Pretty gnarly. Uh, there was a question in the chat here. Let's see what that was. Is this something we could see more of in the future with eBBF um, applications that run in the kernel space as opposed to the user space? Feels like something could go wrong there. Matt, any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm not sure I follow the, the, the jump to that, but maybe I'm, I'm missing something. Yeah, I can't speak to it. Yeah, I guess I guess my thought was just, you know, one of the reasons why CrowdStrike could crash this is because it was a kernel space application as opposed to a user space application. So I'm not an eBPF expert, but I'm pretty sure that runs in the kernel space as well. So I was just curious if maybe there are like more of these applications coming down the pipe. Yeah, obviously the more things uh, that get kind of sideloaded into the kernel, the, the the riskier it is, but I don't have uh, insight on this one. Yeah, I, I would also have to do a little research on how eBPF like verifies things that get loaded into the kernel space um, there. So um, I, I don't know that I'm, that I'm qualified to answer that without doing some research right now. Cool. Uh, anything else on this before we move on to the next topic? All right, next one was uh, just another utility came across my desk, uh, Logu. Um, it's another one of these uh, ways of uh, in real time streaming uh, patterns out of unstructured text, but in a way that makes it easier to not get overwhelmed with content on the screen. I admit I don't fully uh, grok uh, based on the demo, everything going on, um, but it, it reminds me a little bit of how like in Docker when it's scrolling the logs that it collapses certain sections when they're done. That's just what made me think about it, but I haven't uh, gotten to play with it yet. All right, next one was uh, 
coming soon to Kubernetes. Uh, it's been in Docker for 10 years, but finally Kubernetes <laughs> is getting it. It's uh, the ability to mount other images as, as file systems, basically, inside your pod. Uh, very uh, common technique if you're using like Docker Compose, for example, or Docker Swarm. Uh, so it's something, it's not a novel idea. And therefore, I, I, it's almost surprising to me, wait, this wasn't possible? I kind of almost had to scratch my head on that. But yeah, so uh, that'll be nice. It's a great way, for example, if, well, okay, so one use case, for example, is if you're doing preview environments in Kubernetes and you have a database like Postgres, uh, but you want to have um, a snapshot of data ready to go, very easy to use together with that uh, database. You can now just have, here's your Postgres container, here's our uh, data volume, and mount that in and use that. You don't have to do a, a PG load or anything to get that data into your development database. Or let's say you want to run tests and you have five different uh, test scenarios in different data volumes. You can now mount, use the same Postgres and mount the different uh, data volumes and, and run those tests. So, yeah, I've I've also seen this used in in actual production um, for warming caches. Mm. Mm. So people actually wow. ship the the data that they want to load into the cache, like on a on a Docker volume oh, that they can keep up to date. And then when a new system comes up to date, it reads that it reads off of that volume and like and warms the cache so that real traffic can then read, you know, read cache data immediately that's without having to wait for the cache to get populated. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So for that cache use case, you still have to probably rebuild the interval the image on some interval, right? With the with like the latest cache um yeah 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 and it's for like i've seen it mostly on like large scale you know large scale services that have tons and tons of traffic where it would take a long time to to hit all the permutations that might be you know might get loaded into cache so yeah. it's one of the things that they they build in a ci system what the you know what the cache data should be and then when a you know when they bring up a new a new cluster or a new node or you know these things and they're doing it at very large scale so like a new cluster isn't something that happens you know once every couple of years it's something that happens many times a week kind of thing um, they basically bring up a new cluster warm like warm all the caches with you know with preloaded data and then after all that, then they start funneling traffic onto it um, to allow that, you know, to allow their customers to get the normal experience that they expect to see. Yep, that makes sense. And to be clear, in that situation, they're they're using it presumably not as a read-only volume mount, but a read-write volume mount that they continue updating. Or um, I I've seen it both ways. I've actually seen it where it is literally just the warm. The warmer of the cache and then like they're like in this case like imagine a redis cache and that's it that's like all in memory like across a ton of different nodes and then all they do is um they they ship this new version version 7 of cache and when they do that all of the items that are in version 7 of cache get loaded into into their in-memory cache for the the actual traffic to see it Makes sense. Going back to your uh, Postgres example, Eric, what I've been doing so far is I usually just create an image with the data in it, some scrub data set. So I'm just wondering what the benefits are between the two. Like they, they both are kind of, it seems like you're, you're creating an image no matter what. Um, and maybe I guess, you know, yeah. I'm curious. Nick, coupling the versioning and the server from the data layer. Um, you know, yeah. is it a huge improvement? No. Can you make arguments for both? Yes. Uh, I, you know, let's say I, I, this is, look, I'm just trying to be right here by giving you an ex example, but, <laughs> but like, you know, I, I, I want to be testing this version of Postgres uh, at this minor or patch release and you want to do it at another one. Uh, you can do that if you do that without having to rebuild it. Um, yeah. always, you can always do, you know, in multi, uh, in multi-stage Docker builds, you can always just build obviously from, yeah, the two different bases and include the data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think 
it also gets into matrix scenarios. So if you if you want to you want to test multiple Postgres versions with multiple data sets, um, now you're you're starting to have this like factorial uh, problem to solve of how many images you end up having to maintain then with that. Where in this case you can just maintain a single data image for every piece, you know, every data permutation that you want and a single Postgres, you know, uh, image. And then you can load, you know, load the Postgres and whichever permutation of all the data that you want uh, and then be able to use those and then easily mix and match them like on the fly. Yeah, no, uh, that second use case that you mentioned, that matrix, that makes a lot of sense. I also wonder if you, if we could take these containers now and convert them to like PVCs, so like preloads the data, so you can actually do read-write. Because I assume with the current approach, we're expecting to lose the data once the uh, the pod is gone, right? Mm, right, yeah. Yeah, uh, you would definitely lose that data. All right. Cool. Yeah. All right, next uh, topic here was, yeah, just, you know, just showing that you know, white hat white hat hacking uh, pays, obviously probably not as much as the other kind of hacking, but this is a still, you know, uh, you can uh, rest peacefully in bed at night with your 500,000 uh, that you got for finding a vulnerability in Coinbase. Uh, Hopefully they didn't get paid this week in Bitcoin. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah, that's crashed from like seventy to fifty thousand or something, or what is it now? Yeah, I, I haven't looked recently, but it took a steep dive. So, yeah, they told them they were giving them five hundred k, and then they knew what was good, about to happen. So, <laughs> uh, did they share any details on what uh, what was found, or is it? Is there that... were some details. Uh, I forget where. Maybe it was in the. I I saw this on Hacker News. Okay, cool. I'll take it out. Um... But yeah, uh, I don't have that uh, on the top of my mind right now. I forgot what it was. That, that's actually uh, <laughs> according to that that infographic on the right hand side. That's a quarter of all the bug bounties they've ever paid. Scroll down right there, 2 million, two million oh, yeah. <laughs> bounties in bounties paid. <laughs> so yeah. I'm saying that's a pretty big one. Yeah. The average and the average bounty is 200 bucks. So whatever they found must have been like really, really uh, dangerous. Oh, I think I vaguely recall. Yeah, uh, not accurately enough uh, to convey it. It was something about that. Uh, it, the time? No, I'm not even gonna bother. Oh, and they have a cap of one million. So, so it was worth five hundred thousand, but it wasn't worth a million. I'm gonna have to dig into this. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they actually have like a um, a rubric for how they how they pay out their their bonuses. So they have like some some proprietary classification system of how they they identify what what certain things are worth to them, and they they write out like how like how they pay it. Yeah. So and I think like internally, there's even like more like. Um, detail behind it so it isn't arbitrary just like oh wow you know this was really this was really severe we'll give you like 500k it's like it meets certain criteria that they have documented internally and it comes out like a formula basically to how much that bug is worth All right, well, that was it. That's all I got. Any other announcements before we get into Q&A?
Then uh, Q and A. Any uh, any topics we can discuss today? Um, I had one around just using GitHub as a OCI repository for Helm charts. I was curious to know if anyone's doing that today, if they've if that's working out well or not. Uh, I was zoned out for a minute. GitHub as an OCI uh, registry. Yeah, so there's the GitHub for Helm charts. Yeah, for, but for Helm oh, charts. Oh, for Helm charts. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I know of the other approaches uh, where you can use GitHub pages, and then there's a bunch of actions for that. Uh, more recently, I've been looking at trying to use GitHub Container Registry to publish uh, Helm charts uh, using the OCI format, and then you do Helm install OCI colon slash slash. And you can apparently install Helm charts like that. Um, handful of actions out there. None of them seem to work. <laughs> and uh, I was curious to know if anyone's using it. Um, and uh, if so, if there's any recommended GitHub actions. I couldn't find much in the marketplace. And I also really didn't want to write my own. But uh, might be a good one to add to the community. But yeah, figured if might be someone on this call doing it. And if not, um, or maybe someone's using a more paid reliable solution for that versus a uh, GHCR, but yeah. Well, I really like the idea of that. Uh, we've been using the former solution you talked about for a long time, uh, you know, GitHub Actions that build the charts and publish them. Um, okay, in our case, we're not using GitHub pages, but uh, could have just as well done that. Um, we're using S3, but I like the idea of uh, using the new OCI format. One of my questions, uh, back at you in case you happen to know mm -hmm. is uh, it's easy enough to build and publish the chart like that. The tricky part is publishing the index if you want a registry and being able to search it and find all the packages and all the versions. Um, did the actions, whether they were working or not, support that case? Um, and, and is that something you're trying to do as well? Yeah, so from one reason I have not liked OCI format packages is uh, um, it does not support the index at all. That's uh, as far as I know, that's just not there. There's no index.yaml. And so when I've tried in using Argo CD, for example, in the UI, click around and you want to use the OCI repository, um, it works well in GitOps. But if you know what exactly what you want, but when you're doing exploratory stuff, you want to search versions, it, as far as I know, it does not support that. There is no search. If I'm if I'm mistaken, so uh, yeah, so that's missing the GitHub Pages approach. I've done that before, um, and it's super annoying to have binaries checked in to a branch, and you just have like this random branch without replication or anything that you get in S3. So we're using S3 in CloudFront, um, uh, probably similar to what your setup is. That's been working out pretty well. Um, but uh, this particular use case I'm looking at right now uh, is actually just for an open source project uh, I'm collaborating on. And someone has opened up an issue trying to get me to publish the chart, and I've been holding off on that. And uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to avoid creating a GitHub Pages workflow. And so yeah, uh, so I'm pushing this idea of we should try OCI. And uh, yeah, um, it seems like the Helm CLI uh, supports the OCI natively, so there's no plugin or anything. Um, I know Argo CD added support where you can install Helm chart straight from a Git repo. I think you pointed that out to me a while ago, Eric, and that's working yeah. out pretty well. Um, but it's like uh, just trying to get the, uh, I, I think for this individual's use case, they're, they're, they probably need an actual package chart or something supported by the Helm install. So uh, I couldn't figure out, a, I, I haven't tested it, maybe I should, but I don't think you can install from a Git repo using Helm install. I, I think there, you need a third party plugin for that. I can't recall if that was. Oh, or you could clone it. But, um, yeah. I, I have no practical experience with this, but I just did a quick search. Both AWS ECR and Git, uh, Google's artifact registry, both of those support OCI. Right. So does GitHub. So to be clear, we were talking specifically about the index.yaml file. Oh, yeah. Um, if you could have an index of all your OCI charts. Or if somehow it knows the registry protocol well enough just to ask, I guess, the registry for what versions it has. I haven't played with it enough to 
know that. I set this up for Flux and for our GitHub repos, and that seemed to work okay, except um, when you're, the chart name has to be the same as the ECR repo name. So one of my guys recently corrected me and it was like, dude, we just stick the chart in the same ECR repo as the containers, which immediately felt a little dirty to me and I haven't thought it through completely. But my solution had been to have like service and service dash chart repos. So I would push the chart to the dash chart, you know, and that wasn't optimal at all. That was like the worst thing about it. Um, the other approach worked though. Like, could you shove both of them into the same repository? I, he he's done it, and nice. he's a competent engineer. Whether he did it like as dry as possible in Terraform, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I haven't been over there in those guys' code for a while. But the naming thing was an issue, and I don't know how that impacts the index. But what you do have to do is pull the chart, build it, and then push it. Well, you can also push the chart fully built as an artifact to the OCI. You don't need to do the interstitial. And so this this closes the loop on the index the YAML thing. So it is not, I guess you can't have an index that points to a bunch of OCI artifacts. Uh, but to the earlier thing about using the same uh, registry for you know, conventional Docker images as you do for your charts, I mean, it doesn't know what you're pushing. You just need to tag that stuff differently. So you would tag your chart for something different. Yeah, but I know, man. I, and, and I'm not <laughs> still I'm still not sure. I I mean, I think that like to get around that seems yeah. stupid, but you know. Uh, how would the versioning work though? Do you have to do a different version number? One for the Docker image and then one for the, the chart version? Well, or well, versions you... could be whatever. I... They're just tags. Matt. I, I think I think we're conflating two things because I mm -hmm. think the Helm file, the, the not Helm file, the Helm support for OCI registries includes um, what the heck is that extra layer that they build? The provenance layer in there, and the provenance layer actually lays out like all the different versions of what is contained within the OCI artifact. It actually tells you like. The different the different uh, architectures and the versions and all of those things they actually end up in the tarball that gets updated or that gets uploaded to the OCI registry. So I my my understanding is that when Helm reads the OCI registry, it scans like it scans those things to read like what is there and like and the YAML the index YAML based version of Helm or way of doing home charts is considered legacy to the OCI version. Got it. So it can basically just use the combination of uh, native registry functionality and the provenance uh, metadata to get this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, good. I'm Googling really quickly to see if I can find the actual documentation on this because I'm pretty sure it says it somewhere. Yeah, well, I found it here. Uh, I'll drop it. I'll drop it into chat. Cool. Uh, Jonathan, any questions? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I'm looking for tools or maybe techniques, but certainly tools that help me search or document or reason about AWS IAM roles, IAM roles. Um, and policies and users and so on. Uh, I'm finding it very complicated, uh, even though we have a pretty clean sheet design, knowing kind of what rule is uh, currently in use, uh, what role is the appropriate one to use, uh, reasoning about what goes where is, I'm finding it very challenging. And I'm wondering if there's any particular tools to make that easier or at least uh, more possible. Have you looked at IAM Access Analyzer? Yes, uh, it's okay. It's, 
it's kind of a light pass at the at the problem i think it doesn't really seem to it's not comprehensive in uh in any or systematic in any way it you know it feels like it is it is, it is a very light pass does it help me understand the whole set of iam roles or policies and how they fit together it does help me look at kind of an individual uh maybe an individual role or individual situation maybe y'all are just a lot better at i am <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm trying to think like i've i've had some pretty like crazy things i've tried to achieve like by or not crazy but like complicated like trying to understand what's actually in use what's not in use like across you know a lot of different things and i am the i am access analyzer actually does a pretty good job like it i'm not by any means saying it is the best um that that it is the the best or most user-friendly tool but once you get used to all of its kind of like quirks and everything i've i've had pretty good success in tracking down the ability to say like what has access to what in my organization like or or who has actually access, access to what in within an organization pretty well but it's uh it takes some time to get it all set up and yeah, you can a, even have it, another shot yeah i was gonna say and you can even have it do things on like a scheduled basis as well which is pretty cool and it'll send you alerts when certain things fall out of out of bounds that you set up so i find a lot of times uh also the difference between service policies and service control policies and individual policies um there is an all there is a lot of overlap uh that is again diff just difficult to reason about but I'll yeah give, you're, you're not going to get an argument for me. another pass <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry uh, you you won't get an argument for me that that the the permissioning model in AWS is overly complex and there are too many ways to achieve the, the same result we we are 100 percent in agreement on on that part of it um uh, whether or not you could track down what you need to track down with im access analyzer i think just i've had pretty good success with it so i would just strongly recommend doing that there are some third-party tools that i've seen too i just can't think of the name of them right now um if i go back and maybe look in notes i might be able to find them but um the idea there is that they people have put a nice pretty interface around essentially running like described commands for everything like in your everything I am related and pulling that all together in a nice visual way. But um they're the ones that I've looked at for that kind of thing have always been pricey. So I don't know that anyone has a um uh, that anyone has like a good like reasonably priced version of that, but Maybe there's a maybe there's a need there. Uh, sounds like a, a fun open source project to uh, to start on the weekends. <laughs> Great exercise. Anybody looking to learn Go? Here's your chance. We gave you a project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, but uh, yeah, I can identify with that and kind of being able to see there are all these different layers, and if you have all the information on the the same chart, it's just too much information. Uh, and being able to just like let, let's look at one slice of uh, everything, which is just the IAM architecture and uh, the roles and policies, the services are using, the humans are using, and you know, is there an overlap? Uh, are there some that obviously stand out as no longer being used? And what what you know, all that. And yeah, each one of these things, it's a product in and of itself, uh, and it's hard to achieve. Also, just to close the loop on what I was trying to, what I was looking for on the OCI conversation a few minutes ago, uh, this is, this summarizes. So the ability to list charts has been deprecated and that isn't supported in OCI. Uh, so you can only um, get information about any particular chart. Yeah, that, that was kind of what I remembered that. And it, when you do that, it then reads all the version information and everything else out of the tarball that is the OCI like yeah. um, container, essentially. All right, I think someone was raising their hand a second ago. I lost it. 
Andrew. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I see it there. Andrew, question. Yeah. So my question is related to it's 2024 testing cloud infrastructure. Um what's what's kind of the the current state go to as far as like testing this infrastructure created in Terraform? There's a lot of little tools out there. TerraTest looks like it's a big one. Really, the use case that I'm trying to solve is I'd like something that can run <clears throat> that is like lightweight as far as <clears throat> like as part of the commit process. But I would also like alternative tests, maybe some sort of integration test or something that I can run against my cloud environment that just tells me like, Hey, everything's configured the way I think it should be. Almost like a smoke test once it's up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think the the current state of art uh, for that would still be Terra test uh, to be able to do any more advanced testing on that, but it's not as simple as the native testing in Terraform. Um, the native testing yeah. in Terraform is more about just checking values that they are what you'd expect them to be. And if you can somehow find a provider that does the test you want to do, I guess you can add that somehow into your Terraform tests, but that's the one. I think you could um, you could for sure use uh, use local stack as part of the as part of the PR process like you're talking about, so that on every PR you're not spinning up a ton of, you know, a, a ton of infrastructure. Maybe, maybe you, um, you do it for like all the, the commits while the feature branch is open, but on merge, you actually run against the real cloud to see if things happen or something like that. But um, <clears throat> local stack is definitely a way to speed up those tests. Um, presumably, as long as you're using some sort of cloud infrastructure that is supported by local stack. Um, it's gotten really good over the last, you know, year or so. It used to, it used to be a lot clunkier and have a lot less surface area, but they've uh, they've really improved a lot recently. Yeah, I'll share an example uh, that we recently did <clears throat> of how easy it is to incorporate that in your if you use GitHub Actions, assuming that. So um, in your GitHub Action workflow, you can define a service. I just called it local stack. You point it to the local stack image and on the ports and bam, you got local AWS cloud now for the duration of that job um, that you can uh, run. Depending on the sophistication of your uh, module, uh, you can run your tests that way. That's fantastic. So yeah, I'll post this in the chat. Well, thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Oops, that got mangled. Oh, um, any other questions? I have a question, but it looks like Andrew has his hand up. Oh, I think Andrew just asked oh. the previous one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he never put his hand down. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm working in a cluster that doesn't have um, an AWS load balancer controller deployed. And I had gotten um, an application load balancer to deploy there using an annotation. So I guess like in more recent versions, um, without having the ALB controller, you can still um, like integrate services with certain types of load balancers using some annotations, but I'm, I like haven't had a 
any luck finding the documentation that I found before? I was curious, does anyone know of that documentation of like how to integrate with an ALB or an NLB without having the ALB controller? So you can do an NLB uh, by default, like it'll automatically provision one and there's a handful of annotations. But it's like, not... like a service load balancer? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's just a basic load balancer. And then um, if you were to use like Nginx or Traffic behind it, you could you could ideally get all, all the functionality you want. So you'll get an NLB by default. Um, or you can set an annotation get to have it forcefully provision the NLB by default. This is without having the load balancer controller or anything else. And then you'll get like a TCP tunnel from that. And then you can basically run Nginx or uh, Traffic behind it. Um, and there's like a few more annotations, but it's not as well supported as as the recommended solution of an ALB or using the load balancer controller. So uh, some of the annotations, it, I don't think it's deprecated yet. It's just kind of like they're chugging along on support and they're releasing updates, but they aren't adding new functionality. For example, you don't get the security group functionality that you would get if you use a load balancer controller. So it, um, you don't get you can't add a security group to your NLBs. Oh, but okay. you're looking for, uh, so you're going back to your original question, uh, you're looking for the documentation on it, correct? Yeah. So, so I'm going I'm to post in the chat, this is what I was able to to use to stand up an ALB with uh, an internal ALB on just a basic service without the ALB controller. Um, so I was trying to, tr I was kind of trying to find the equivalent to that um, for an NLB. I think I think it maybe this started. Oh, the, that's the annotation. Sorry, I thought that was the link to the doc. Sorry. Oh yeah. Read what you posted there. Yeah. I think it was in one two six or one two seven that this started working without the ALB controller. Um, right. you're in the Cod Posse chat, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to cool. send it in Slack, that's great. Um. Yeah. I'll let me. I'll see if I can find it. I I know. I have an idea of what you're talking about. Um, okay. And <laughs> If someone else knows where it is, uh, that's great. But I, I've, I've definitely stumbled across those docs. Um, I actually did not know you could do an ALB with the, without the ALB controller. So that, that's interesting. I thought it provisioned an ELB. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if we can dig it up on my end. I'll, I'll let you know in about, it might take me a few minutes, but I, I should probably save this somewhere for myself as well. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, can I ask the silly question of, why? Like, why don't you just have the ALB controller, the load balancer I'll controller? Let, uh, I'll let T uh, Taylor answer that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so basically, I, I'm the I'm on SRE, and so the DevOps owns this cluster. So we're in the process of deploying a new SRE owned cluster where I'll, I'll put the ALB controller, but they're using like Ambassador uh, instead of the ALB controller. And um, so, like before, I went down the rabbit hole of figuring that out. I I had stumbled across these docs that allowed you to do it without it. Um, but yeah, it obviously lacking a lot of features and it's not something I would have done, but it's just kind of in the situation I'm in. So uh, even as it relates to the ALB controller though, uh, and therefore I would have to uh, assume similar concerns would exist even if you went this route. Um, one of the hard lessons that we learned along the way um, and let me just get this teed up here, is um, the first, well, at least when using ingresses, uh, the first service that deploys it owns kind of that ingress. And if that service gets destroyed, every other service um, uh, could be impacted by it if the load balancer goes away. Uh, that is either what I uh, misrecollect or the other recollection that I'm pretty sure is you it, the annotations can be conflicting between services that share and a um, a load balancer and uh, they they can be there for fighting uh, based on which one gets deployed most recently on on that configuration for the ingress. So we've made it a best practice that we provision explicitly groups before provisioning any services. And those groups own the annotations on what we want to have, like the ACM certificate and any allow list and things like that. And then, uh, and then when a service deploys, it says what group it wants to participate in. 
That way we don't have this problem um, of uh, services deploying their own ingress uh, resource and fighting with the controller. Uh, real fast, Taylor, I think I found the link you're talking about and I threw it in the chat. Oh, okay, sorry. yeah. And, and with that annotation, I, I could easily be remembering wrong. Like looking at it now, it seems like that one line wouldn't be enough to stand up an ALB since you'd need, you know, target group and things. So um, don't hold me to that. That could have just easily been an internal ELB. Okay, yeah, cool. I think by default an ELB or an NLB, but this thing is highly limited and uh, yeah, really shouldn't be using it, but yeah. Okay, thank you. We got another few minutes if there's any last questions uh, that we can get answered. All right. Going once, going twice. Um, I actually do have one. It's a, It might be a little out of context, but I figure since there's a lot of smart people on this call, someone might be playing around in their home labs. Um, does anyone here do IoT deployments, like using Belena or Terizon or any of those IoT fleet managers? Just curious on like what solution, if any, you folks are using. So in the past, um, I worked on Bolina, but it's been a while. Let's say uh, back in 2020, 2019. Um, I always field a few questions. Oh, yeah. I, I've been playing around the Bolina cloud recently. I was pretty impressed by it. I have a uh, uh, old colleague. It's going a lot. Out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty cool. They they let you self-host it. I haven't looked at self-hosting the EV10 devices for free. Um, I learned about Horizon OS. Just wondering if there's any other ones that people are using. Uh, using Bolena uh, makes it more appealing to stick to it now, or haven't used it in the past. But yeah, uh, it seems like there's a lot of different IoT deployment solutions. And uh, yeah, wasn't sure. They really are. <laughs> How does well, this really it... out what you're working on? Oh, this is actually uh, this is. Unrelated to all of that. <laughs> yeah, none of the questions I've asked today are actually in regards to stuff I'm doing for work. <laughs> so um, <laughs> these are other questions of my network, com uh, questions coming to me from others in my network working on different things. But yeah. So I can I can speak to, you know, uh, at that at that role, I was there for four years, uh, all AWS based. Several different things were tried. I think that uh, what your hardware is dictates a lot of what will be best for uh, for deployment. And um, in our case, we were using um, basically custom hardware in some cases. So we, we definitely preferred Belina for that. Um, we did try, uh, I think the worst one that we had was, uh, I think it, I don't know if Amazon is still doing it. Uh, it's, it's green grass. Green grass. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. had a pretty rough time with that. Um, but we tried it for a bit, gave it a good shot. And then when we fixed a few bugs with it and worked around some loopholes, then we even got contacted by AWS. Um, they wanted to propose us uh, ex uh, doing a, a, a co-op of some, some uh, beta stuff, but uh, we declined. Um, it was already a little bit too expensive. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was a lot of edge, edge stuff that we were doing and the DevOps of it was really sophisticated that, that case. Yeah. They're also evaluating, uh, ADBS. Um, I brought up Belena cause I've been poking around with that. Um, and they're looking at Tryzen as well, which I have not touched at all. Um, when you ran Belena, did you folks have issues updating the actual Belena OS? Um, we we didn't do it very much. Uh, a lot of what we we had set up everything to be so contained within uh, within the con the the Docker container that um, it 
it wasn't usually necessary. I think that what we would do though, we had um, a whole test area and it was um, lots and lots of instrumentation, lots of stress testing uh, when we were doing it. So we had at our test area, oh, I'd say about 20 or 30, I think virtual uh, deployment areas. And we had, so redundantly set it all up um so that when we were going to test something it was uh it was going to be in with robots actually acting like uh triggering motion sensors and everything else we had all the iot stuff actually running while we did these updates and um we had a grafana cluster for taking all the instrumentation because cloud watch is too expensive um And uh, yeah, and um, we had a lot of other stuff. Uh, and yeah, if we ever had a problem, we just sniffed it out in there and we we fixed it there. Uh, but I wasn't a part of the team that did the fixing. I mostly did the DevOps of, you know, we, we had Jenkins for releases. Um, it would kick off the builds and then do all the API calls to uh, Belena, if I recall correctly. Um, and that stuff was... Fairly what you would find in any tutorial, just, uh, maybe with some more um, hooks in it for notifying um, different uh, folks if things go wrong. Yeah, I, I looked at uh, when I was playing on the Blender Cloud, it looked like you'd also self host it. I didn't bother because they give you 10 devices for free, but uh, and their pricing oh, yeah. per device isn't too bad, but yeah. Cool. Appreciate yeah, yeah. the uh, details on that. With uh, IoT Greengrass, Does that do they give you telemetry back in the CloudWatch? Like, does it actually show up in the AWS dashboard? You know, because I know with Blena, you get some telemetry, like CPU temperature yeah. and all that. Yeah, you get you get enough telemetry to know something's breathing. Um, but uh, we had to definitely do our own active tests. We actually had um, some some tricky stuff that we did because we we used Celery. And a Python application, a Django application. So um, we we had to make our own instrumentation for both cases, actually, not just building it, but also doing green grass. Um, but in that case, um, we really it was actually pretty funny. Um, oh yeah, we're getting close to the time, so I'll just wrap this up. Um, <laughs> we we basically had our own instrumentation using Telegraph, which is what I would recommend using if you can. Um, That was really effective, and it sends it to CloudWatch, sends it to Grafana, sends it to anything you want, uh, even Datadog. Very easy to configure. Cool. I'll check it out. Uh, Greengrass, I wasn't sure if it's going to get killed or if it's going to be kept around, but um, yeah, I'll recommend it to everybody as well. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Final clarification, Greengrass is another AWS service? No. Yeah. And how does that relate to IoT Core? It, it does rolling releases. Um, if I recall correctly, and on top of that, uh, as um, Venkat was saying, it's got some integration with other AWS services. You don't have to work as hard to connect. Is it complementary or an alternative to? Or it's like a manager of. If you you look at the like. Remember how we were talking about firewall manager and something else, the, the VPC manager oh, or whatever? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's basically like an overlay over oh, many services okay. that helps orchestrate a bunch of services to work together for a specific purpose with IoT. Uh, yeah. And just really, really quickly for Venkat, just on the on the the diagram of everything with Greengrass, um, it shows like data exchange with CloudWatch. So I assume that it means that the metrics that you choose to collect from your devices will end up in CloudWatch, so you could then put them on a CloudWatch dashboard. So, Cool. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks. If you're someone here, I uh, played around with this tech. <laughs> so it was not wrong. Yeah. Thank you. I just looked at diagrams and docs. I haven't actually used it. so, <laughs> <laughs> But it looks like it would from the, from the doc. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for your time today. That wraps up our hour here with Office Hours. Uh, we'll be posting a recording of this session in about an hour, uh, so you can follow up uh, and share that with your team. 
If you are curious about working with Cloud Posse at some point, um, we are available for hire. Go to cloudposse.com slash meet, answer a few quick questions, and you'll book a meeting with me directly. If you want to get more involved with our community, here are a bunch of resources at your disposal. Uh, we have our weekly office hours like this one. Just go to cloudposse.com slash office hours to register. Our newsletter, which is a weekly syndication of the links and interesting announcements that we bring up every week and our Slack community. So go to slack.cloudposse.com for that. With that said, thanks all. Take care. See you.